Okay, good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to all the delegates uh, for this session on this ocular burns. So my topic for this instruction course is dowsing the fire. This is the ocular burn course. This is repeated course. It was also uh, that means uh, uh, taken up last year also. So we all know that ocular burns are one of the true ophthalmic emergencies. And it is the only ocular condition where history taking and examination should be delayed and start immediate management without taking any uh, there been history or proper examination of the patients. There should be coordination with physician, surgeon, and psychiatrist. And we should know that bilateral chemical exposure is especially devastating, often resulting in complete visual recover disability. So we should manage them very properly. And proper management in the acute stage is most important because otherwise we have to treat this, uh, this burn sequelae, that the cicatricial complications. And this long-term damage to the ocular surface is mainly due to chronic inflammation, often causes fibrosis and continues to cause damage to the conjunctival and limbal stem cells. There will be subconjunctival fibrosis, which leads to simuliferin formation for initial shortening along with cicatricial entropion. In all these cases, there will be goblet cell deficiency, which results in abnormalities in the surface mucus secretion, which ultimately lead to poor tear dysfunctions along with the dry eye. So the, the course outline is that Dr. Aditya Padhan, he will be talking about this uh, ocular bond spectrum classification and overview. I will be talking on the management of different types of ocular burns in acute and initial stages. Dr. Poros Mohata, she will be talking on this late visual rehabilitation in unilateral cases by different modalities of treatment. And Dr. Supnil, he will be talking on late visual rehabilitation in bilateral ocular burn cases by different modalities of treatment like Kepro or Aloslate. So what to you, Dr. Aditya? Yes. You'll be there. Recorded. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Tuhin, for the inclusion in the instruction course. So, my topic is basically providing an overview and classification of the different spectrum of ocular burns. I have no financial interest to disclose. So, basically, chemical or radiant energy injuries to the ocular surface constitute what we commonly known as, call as ocular burns. So as Sir has rightly mentioned, it is the true ocular emergency. It can cause extensive damage and significant ocular or morbidity to the ocular surface leading to blindness in the long term. For developed countries, we have the statistics which say around 1.25% to 4.4% of the total burden of blindness. It's more commonly seen in men, either in their workplace or homes. Sometimes it can be a result of assault or vitriolage, which has some medical legal implications as well. So proper history taking will help us determine what is the mode of injury, whether it is deliberate or accidental. So if you see the statistics from the developed world, most of the common implicated agent are the household cleaning agents, either the bathroom cleaning acids or the strong alkalis. 
So they constituted around 29% of the total uh, cause of ocular burns. And in males, it was around 57%. The next common was more personal care products and automotive chemicals. Then the percentage goes on reducing for the other chemicals which you come across in day-to-day -day life. So if you see in the details of the household cleaning agents, the most common was bleach, so which is a very strong alkali. There are certain all-purpose cleaners, disinfectants, laundry detergents, which make up around 15 to 20% each. In personal care products, hair products like dyes, coloring dyes were most commonly Im implicated. In the other automotive group, the splash of battery acid, which is basically strong sulfuric acid, that was most commonly implicated in the causative agents. So if you see this graph in which the, the percentage of the rate of injuries, ocular injuries by certain burns, caustic alkalis, acids, was plotted with the age of the patient. So you see two peaks. So one peak is in the early childhood, around zero to five years of age, in which the children are caught playing with certain offensive agents. And then there is a decline in these adolescent years. Again, there is a peak in the younger outgrowing group, mostly in the males, maybe around 18 to 30 years of age who are engaged in. As the age increases and the person becomes more confined indoors, doesn't lead active life, the number of, the rate of ocular burns reduces. So again, this, this study is from some Indian data way back in 1993, in which again commonly the alkalis were around 36% of the causative agents. Acids were more commonly seen, 48%. Certain miscellaneous chemicals in the laboratory, around 14%. And as expected, factory workers, laboratory workers were more commonly exposed to these offensing agents. So this study from RP Center, in which they have studied the clinical profile of ocular injuries in the pediatric age group. So the most common offending agent was bursting of tuna packets which I will come to later in which certain measures have been taken by the government. So if you see the classification of the ocular burns, Balin introduced the first treatment and the classification of the eye way back in 1964. So Roper and Hall modified this balance classification and it was quite in use for so many decades until we came to the DUAS classification which is currently the most widely accepted and used classification in practical day-to-day -day clinics. So if you see the Roper Hall classification, which is the modified Ballon classification, there are four grades and you have the damage to the cornea and you have the conjunctival or the limbus involvement. As the grades increase, the prognosis worsen. So in grade one, it is just mild epithelial damage and the limbus and conjunctiva are intact. As you move to grade three and four, so basically the entire cornea is damaged and more than six clock hours of the limbus or the conjunctiva are also having ischemia. So these are some of the, basically this is not the Roper Hall, this is the five star classification which came between Roper Hall and Dua, in which these photographic images were used as a reference to use in the clinic. And these images were compared to the patient's eye and then the gra grading was done like normal, mild, moderate, moderate to severe. So if you see the very severe, which would maybe ab about grade six of Dua, complete blanching, whitening of the cornea and total scleral ischemia. But this is not easily reproducible. It is quite subjective what I may say mild, somebody may say normal. So this was not very much in use. Then we came to the most current classification that is the DUA system in which we have six grades. The prognosis obviously worsens from grade one to six. And you have clock hours of limbus involvement, the percentage of involvement and the analog scale. So basically, as you move in severity, maybe the, the photo I showed earlier. So grade six is very poor in which the total limbus, 12 clock hours are involved and the conjunctival involvement is also 100%. So you have these images from the original article in which the different grades and so this would be a grade three in which the conjunctival limbus is involved with a persistent epithelial defect. So fluorescein stain is extremely important in identifying the extent of damage, what may appear clear on the slit lamp may actually be a total epithelial defect which may get missed if you don't use fluorescein stain. So you have different images to go through and this article was from BGO in which they compared the value of Roper Hall and Dua classical system. Basically a head-to-head -head study between the two systems. So basically Roper Hall 
since it stops at grade 4 and dua stops at grade 6 so basically the dua classification has a superior prognostication value because you have more variables to play with so this another classification came out in 2020 which is not in practical use but then they have gri given grade 0 1 2 3 and opacification of the corneal surface the vascularization of the surface and the degree of simulation formation were used to classify the degree and the severity of the ocular injury but as i said it is not in common use it's just one one more classification so we all know that limbal ischemia the worse worse the ischemia it is giving rise to worse prognosis but this study which was carried out in IGO in 2019 in which a series of photographs were presented to both cornea specialists, general specialists and fellows in which they were asked to just look at the image without looking at the patient themselves. What grade they feel this image represented on the DUA scale. So as they found out that there was a wide disagreement between the specialist and the general ophthalmologist because the photography is highly subjective. So what I may feel this is severe ischemia somebody may say this is grade 2 or grade 3 so we still don't have a very subjective classification system which covers all the aspects especially the scleral part of it so now we move on to the new kid on the block is basically the application of octa, uh, octa that is oct angiography to the anterior segment our vitreoretinal colleagues are very familiar with this diagnostic modality for us it is quite new so this can be used to prognostic the injury in the acute stage and then decide whether you need more invasive procedures like a AMT or T non plus T to reduce uh, to establish vascularity on the surface. So this article has shown that ASOCT angiography it's an objective non-contact and a rapid assessment of limbal vasculature. However, we don't have very great indices to assess this. So that extent. Dr. Science Group has come out with this article providing a review of the role of Octa in, you just see two different images on the top panel and the bottom panel. So on the left is the OCTA image of the four quadrants of the limbus. And you see this, the patient has presented on day one with total epithelial defect on the cornea. As the days have progressed to day seven, day 14 and day 28, by the 28th day, the everything has healed nicely the limbal vasculature is also not much disturbed. The inferior panel shows some d disturbance because of the d disturbance in the conjunctival cornea, the conjunctival epithelial defect. But you see the bottom part in which the vessels are hardly seen. And as the days have progressed, the epithelial defect has just healed only slightly leading to what we call as PED or a persistent epithelial delay by day 28. So the management of top panel and bottle pa panel is totally different. In the bottom one, you would be more aggressive with your initial management. Again, with the similarly on diffuse illumination, on fluorescent stain and OCT imaging. So you have day one images going up to sixth month. So you see in this panel and this panel, there is a persistent epithelial defect by six weeks. And it has led to a local limbal stem cell failure and a pseudoterygium has come into the picture and the surface has healed. So the vasculature is quite intact, just that there is focal LSCD. So definitely this article has shown that clinical examination alone is insufficient to assess the presence and ex extent of ischemia. We need something which is more objective and gives us then images which is rapid and non-contact. Now we have more indices to assess the parameters on octa. So now we can serially monitor these patients to differentiate what is actually ischemia and what is vasospasm. Vasospasm can easily resolve with conservative management, but if it is true ischemia, you need more aggressive management right from day one. So this as talking about Chuna packets, so this advisory has come in collaboration with the government of India in which say no to Chuna packets, please discourage children from buying these on behalf of their elders because they play, they throw it in the air, the packet just bursts and causes devastating injuries. So the take clinic message is it's a true ocular emergency. It can cause significant morbidity and blindness. You need more public awareness. You need a better classification system because the scleral ischemia part is not very clear in the current classification. And you need more standardization by Octa. Thank you so much.
Uh, excellent presentation, Aditya. So, uh, take home message from your presentation for uh, those who do not have access to uh, OCT-based angiography would be that uh, what Dr. Dua has done, uh, he has mainly differentiated, he has uh, discouraged the use of term ischemia. So, right away we cannot say that it is ischemia. You just have to stain the limbus. If there is limbal staining, you just say that it is involvement. Assess the patient daily whether uh, you know uh, the staining is decreasing at the limbus and you know the epithelium is healing. If it is healing, then we can say that it was just an involvement and not ischemia. It was vasospasm. reversible or rather vasospasm. Yes. And uh, you know we can get away with that case if uh, on a daily basis if it is not healing, then yes. probably it is an ischemia. So probably uh, even if we don't have the OCT NGO, yes, we can do. just uh, look look at the picture and assess daily and just label it as ischemia and involvement later on. Right. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next talk is by Dr. Tuhin Chaudhary. He is an cornea and ocular surface consultant at Disha Hospital, Kolkata. So uh, he would be uh, talking about management of uh, different types of ocular burns in acute and uh, initial stages. So initial stages of presentation, he is going to talk. Okay, so you have, now you have understood this ocular classification and, and prognostication of these cases. Now you have to go for management. As I have mentioned that we should not wait for proper examination and go for immediate management. So regardless of the uh, chemicals involved, the common principles of management include removing the offending agent, controlling inflammation, prevention of infection, control intraocular pressure, and promote ocular surface healing. <clears throat> so I'll be talking both medical as well as surgical management. Because so immediate copious irrigation remains the single most important therapy for treating chemical injuries. And ideally the eye should be irrigated with a sterile balanced buffered solution such as normal saline or uh, ring selected solution. Why balanced buffered solution? Because it binds both acids as well as bases properly and it, is, it has no exothermic effect. So there will be no exothermic effect, so there will be no pain, anything like that. But you should uh, use this, uh, this solution very rapidly and you should not wait for that. For proper ideal fluid, you can use this even plain tap water also. Then the irrigation uh, solution must contact ocular surface. Sometimes these, uh, these uh, patients are so much having pain so they don't open the eyes. So you put some anesthetic drops and then put some eye speculum and then put this uh, irrigating uh, solutions. You can use this Morgan Flint solid speculum as I mentioned. And irrigation should be continued until the pH of the ocular surface is neutralized, usually requiring one to two liters of fluid and at least for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Control of inflammation, as because this inflammatory mediator released from the ocular surface at the time of injury causes tissue necrosis because of the release of uh, this toxic materials like matrix metaloproteinases, stimulations, all these cause inflammation. And this inflammatory response not only inhibits epithelialization, <clears throat> but also increases the risk of corneal ulceration and perforation. So uh, potent corticosteroids is the mainstay of treatment and it should be started immediately. Uh, that is this dexamethasone 0.1 percent or pedacetate 1 uh, percent or dexamethasone 0.1 percent. And it should be given one to two hourly basis. And for severe inflammation, if it is not con uh, controlled with topical uh, medications, then we have to go for systemic corticosteroids. And there is no increased risk of corneal melting or con uh, with concurrent use of ascorbate or any citrate in severe cl clinical ocular burns. In all these cases, one should remember that we should give this topical steroids at least for seven to 10 days. And then see that if this epithelial defect is not there, then we can continue. If there is epithelial defect, then we should not use it. Or if we, if we use it, we should closely monitor these patients and we should go for weaker steroids like Promethalone or lutepredinol, not predacetate. Then we have to promote the ocular surface healing, that is by repithelialization of the cornea is the key challenge both in acute and chronic cases. Topical ocular lubricants are essential for maintaining a moist and ocular surface that facilitates repithelialization of the cornea. And we, here we should use these preservative-free lubricants. 
then we have to use this uh, this autologous peripheral blood serum or umbilical cord serum or platelet rich plasma for, to for ocular surface healing by sormitol this that was a double must randomized controlled trial they found that as receiving umbilical cord serum had a significantly lower mean time to complete repatrialization <coughs> the reduced limbal ischemia and better coronal clarity than patients who are receiving autologous peripheral blood serum or artificial tears so coronal stromal healing as i mentioned that in inflammatory cell mediators release mmp collagenase and stromulacins which will cause collagen breakdown so there is a strong evidence of role of tetracycline so in these cases we should use this doxycycline which has this inhibitory effect on mmp9 so doxycycline can be given after the age of 12 years 100 mg two times daily for two weeks and then we can use it one time daily for four weeks then coronal stromal healing can be promoted by using this uh, that means this ascorbate and citrate ascorbate and citrate both can be used to both topically as well as systemically both are 10% drops which are used to hourly so infection is a common thing because of there is absent uh, there, there is this epithelial defect so in all these cases we should go for broad spectrum antibiotics or even we can use this fourth generation fluoroquinolones acute uh, this uh, chemical injury causes uh, this trabecular meshwork damage and then there is a chance of immediate rise in intracular pressure so you have to control the intracular pressure here in all these cases we should use this tablet acetazolamide because it has no epithelial toxic effects otherwise in some cases we can go for this uh, timolol maliate then to control pain we have to give this cyclophlegics and sometimes oral painkiller tablets so to summarize topical antibiotics still defects heal topical corticosteroids that is dexamethasone 0.1% or pedacetate 1% one to two hourly basis tr substitutes preferably preservative free or cmc 0.5% eye drops topical cyclophlegics especially by uh, atropine and then beta blockers in some cases topical potassium ascorbate 10% drop or sodium citrate 10% eye drop two hourly basis oral doxycycline acetazolamide and ascorbates so vitamin c 500 mg two times daily uh, two tablets four times daily so 1 g qid is the ideal dose for or vitamin c tablet now coming to this surgical therapy surgical therapy by amniotic membrane transplant and now in current scenario this amt is the most common use for uh, in ocular thermal or chemical injuries we can use this amt if you don't have amt then we can use this large diameter bandage contact lens sometimes we have to go for conjunctival or tenon serpent transplant that is tenon stenon plasty limbal stem cell transplant can be done also in acute stage also sometimes we have to go for conjunctival transplantation from the other eye so amt can be used both as a graft where it will be acting as a basement membrane for epithelialization or it can be uh, used as a patch that is this uh, this epithelial side down where it will be acting as a biological bandage contact lens so amt helps in ocular surface reconstruction it promotes rapid epithelial healing it partially restores limbal stem cell function so in this uh, surgical video that uh, this is a patient who had this grade uh, four amt as i mentioned that any patient who is having grade three to grade six uh, this uh, chemical injury they should go for amt in grade one or grade two we should not go for amt the, usually on these cases we can go you can just this can be managed by medical treatment so this patient had this uh, this uh, chuna injury and this this is this upper uh, fornix this chuna was removed and then there was some necrosis of the superior fornicial area so here all this in all these cases we have to go for 360 degree congenital peritomy and then amt is put as a graft that means the epithelial side is up then we have to put this fibrin glue if you don't have any fibrin glue then you have to suture it by in the to this age of the hamnitic membrane with the age of the conjunctiva by 70 vicl sutures and then put a circumciliary this uh, that pastin suture by tenonylon otherwise fibrin glue is the best so it is less uh, toxic and less inflammatory so i am covering the uh, this ocular that means this corneal surface and then suturing
This is 70 fecal. Then in this superior fornix, so I'm putting another piece of amniotic membrane. So again, I am fixing it by using fibrin glue. So if we don't have any fix fibrin glue, then in the lead margins, we have to suture it by using uh, this uh, tenonylon sutures. Then put a conformer or simplifier on ring. And this is the follow-up, final follow-up. At least this eye is saved now. Now this patient is waiting for limbal stem cell transplantation along with this penetrating keratoplasty. Now, suppose if we don't have any, this fibrin glue, then we can use this, uh, this for the fornix, we can use this double-armed uh, 40 silk fornix retaining sutures over a bolster, or even we can use this, uh, this proline sutures also. And to the lead margins, we can use this, as I mentioned, that this tenonylon sutures. And this is the front view, and this is the sidereal view. Sometimes, in presence of scleral ischemia, that is the blanched out white appearing sclera, where amniotic membrane transplantation in these cases won't suffice, and these patients need tenonoplasty or congenital transplantation. So, what is that? This tenonoplasty, that is in 1989, Tapping and Reem first reported use of tenonoplasty by stretching and advancing a viable and non ischemic pedicle tenon graft from the adjacent fornix, and that way it holds progressive scleral melt and to facilitate congenital healing. So, it, it is considered as a globe sewing procedure that helps and accelerates the reepithelialization of the cornea and congenital through limbal perfusion. So, this is the patient who had this burn injury six days ago. And uh, this area was totally necrosed, and this limbal, that scleral ischemia was there. So you can see that this is here in classical uh, tenon plasty. We have to take these tenons and then suture it in this area. But sometimes, if it is too much thin, or if it is just like char, then we cannot suture it because that then sutures will be suture, just gap away or cheese wear. Cheese wearing the sutures will be done. So what happened to that? So. So I have taken this uh, uh, tenons after this uh, removing all those necrosis tissues. Excuse me, can you come? Why are you not playing here? Come, not do it. Don't do it. This color, bro. Okay, thank 
you. So I took this tenons and then put this amniotic membrane here and then sutured it. Because here this tenons, I cannot put it over the sclera. So I put it over the amniotic membrane and then sutured it. Then again, another piece of amniotic membrane was put to cover the, this, this denuded area of this uh, cornea. And then to just fix this amniotic membrane, we have used this uh, tenon island suture, which is placed over this uh, in the periliptory limbal area by using tenon island suture. So first amniotic membrane is just to, uh, used for tenonoplasty and second amniotic membrane to cover this, uh, this ocular, the corneal epithelial defect only. Then a bandage contact lens was put here. And this patient now, after 10 days, you can see that this, this area of this, this amniotic membrane is getting disintegrated. And then after three weeks, this amniotic membrane is getting totally getting disintegrated and there is some sort of scleral ischemia is getting healed up now. But still now this ischemic part is still now there. So again, in this after six weeks, you can see that ischemic part is getting better, but there is a non-healing epithelial defect. At this visit, we started using this autologous serum. Then after three months, this uh, epithelial defect is getting healed up. And this is the picture after six months, patient's globe is preserved. And after two years, now patients got good vision of around 6 by 36 now. So in presence of uh, corneal perforation with diffuse scleral ischemia and thinning, one, this conventional PK may not be feasible because of non-viability of the paralimbal sc uh, scleral tissue. So in these cases, we cannot go for PK. So here we can go for that large lamellar sclerocorneal graft to enhance tectonic support and then a simultaneous or a subsequent central full thickness PK to address the ocular issues. So this is a patient, again this patient, you can see that there are the 90% thinning hair. So again, I did this keratoplasty, I did this amniotic membrane transplant, and this, this surgery was done just three days before lockdown. Patient was from distant places, patient lost follow-up, and patient came, <coughs> so same way this surgery was done, And then patient came after 30, 40 days with this uh, large perforation. Patient could not use any sort of steroids, any sort of drops. So on that day, I did this therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty because there was some lead issues, so I did this uh, temporary tarsorophy also. So this was the picture on first day of therapeutic PK. Then after 21 days, this uh, graft was well taken up. But after four months, this patient again having this non-epithelial epi uh, non epithelial defect. So a patient was again put on autologous serum. And after nine months of therapeutic graft, this graft is quite healed up, but there is vascularization. So I have a patient's vision is, that means now only by six by 60 vision. I asked the patient to go for again, a, uh, this optical PK, but patient didn't want to go for any surgery now. So tenonoplasty sometimes one may have to repeat the procedure and may have to augment by doing lumbar stem cell transplantation or oral or labial mucous membrane grafting. When the globe integrity is saved and ocular surface is stable, then we can plan for further surgeries for future visual rehabilitation. So this is a patient uh, that means who had this, this, uh, this acute injury with this almost 95% thinning area. So what is that, that I did this tenonoplasty along with I took this labial mucous membrane graft from and then put on the same day. And this is the picture after one year, this globe is preserved now. So from this, I have to go for both amniotic membrane transplantation along with this labial mucous membrane grafting in these cases.
So sometimes we can use uh, this fibrin glue or uh, thymacrylate glue for small perforations. This is a patient who had this firecracker injury. So on, on that day, what I, I thought that this injury was not, it was not fully perforated. So I put this fibrin glue, uh, sorry, cyanoacrylate glue and then BCL. Patient was, uh, the patient rubbed the eyes and patient came after three days with a uh, lot of watering. So I took the patient on this op operation theater and what I saw that there was a large frank perforation. So I took out this glue and then I put this tenon patch graft along with this congenital autograft from other eye. So this is a picture, this you can see this tenon patch graft here and then this is congenital autograft from other eye. This is a patient who had this uh, uh, injury from multiple metal 35, uh, 12 days ago. So, what's the time now? Okay. So, the, this patient who had this scleral necrosis along with scleral melt. This was the inferior area, furnishal area. So, while we are doing it, we have to separate all sorts of uh, necrotic tissues and then separate this uh, inferior rectus muscle and then measure this scleral defect. So whenever we are putting this scleral patch graft, so we have to just laminar, uh, laminar dissection should be done. It should not be full thickness. We can make it half thickness and then we have to put it. So you can use this 70 or 60 or 50 sutures. Along with this, we can use this fibrin glue. And then large congenital autograph taken from the other healthy eye. So we have to take this graft from other eye. And then put over this, uh, over the scleral patch graft. So this is the pre-op picture, upon the first post of day this was the picture and after 21 days this patient has improved and this globe is saved now. After two months this graft is quite well taken up and this is the picture after one year. So uh, if we look in follow-up visits, so corneal ulceration or perforation should be looked for and corneal scarring with a limbal stem cell deficiency. We should look for secondary open angle glaucoma. Congenital scarring and similar form also should be looked for. This patient should be looked for dry eye. And even in these cases, because of lead malposition, there will be exposure. So we should think about that. And if there is, we should treat that. So to conclude, proper management in the acute stage is the most important and that determines the long-term outcome. When the globe integrity is saved and ocular surface is stable, one can plan further surgery for better visual rehabilitation. And that will be dealt by uh, my next speakers. And based on severity and laterality, many options like uh, for the bi unilateral cases, we can go for congenital autograft or slate. For bilateral cases, we can go for allo slate or K-Pro. And glaucoma, the most common comorbidity and needs to be addressed aggressively. Thank you for your patient hearing. So the, for the interest of time, we'll be taking all sorts of questions when all the speakers finishes their talk. So over to you, Dr. Sopnil. So yeah. you just Thank you. Excellent presentation. Uh, two tips from my side. Uh, mm -hmm. One is if you don't know what to do in chemical injuries, uh, yeah. one thing you can do is you can just wash the eye and do tarsography. I'm sure everyone sitting over here know how to do at least a basic tarsography. Uh, that is one procedure uh, which will, even if you don't do anything and just do a central tarsography and wait uh, till, or, uh, till you refer the patient or patient is not ready to go, you just do tarsography and give medications and that will heal for sure. 
Second, in acid injuries, sometimes you see a lot of diffuse pigmentation or even hypopion in the antechamber. And that is the sign, even if the IOP is low at that time, the patient is definitely going to develop the glaucoma and uh, keep a watch on that because sometimes we just uh, forget to look for the IOP because we, our whole concentration is on the surface, how to make the surface heal. And uh, we realize when the surface heals after four or six weeks, by the time optic nerve is gone because IOP really tends to shoot very high in especially acid injuries. So I think that one sign you need to look for and always observe the IOP in all the cases. Thank you, Dr. Twin. Next talk is, sorry, yeah. Do go for this, uh, at that time, do go for any sort of paracentesis, anything like that? No, I think just adding the topical medications, like uh, topical medications and dimox, whatever we can add. So we just need to be aware that IOP is going to get raised and if by medical management, if it doesn't count down, then you can think about other uh, ways to lower the IOP. But uh, just my point is don't ignore that thing. Next talk is by uh, Dr. Paras Mehta, who is a, a distinguished uh, cornea and ocular surface surgeon from Vadodara, Gujarat. Uh, she is talking about late visual rehabilitation in unilateral cases where other eye is normal and patient has got a, a, a chemical injury in only one eye. So she is going to talk about how to rehabilitate those patients uh, and give them vision in ipsilateral cases. So uh, over to you, Dr. Paras. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Uh, Swapni. And I would like to thank Dr. Tuhin and, uh, you know, for letting me fill in for Dr. Jayesh Wazirani. Uh, I would be essentially talking to you about late visual re rehabilitation in unilateral ocular burn cases by different modalities of treatment. Once you have treated a patient of acute burns and you have allowed the ocular surface to stabilize well, then the area of, you know, I mean, uh, this rehabilitation would come because you have to take care of their visual needs and the other areas. Uh, we all know that limbal stem cells are responsible for the regeneration of the corneal epithelium, epithelial uh, epithelium, and maintenance of the integrity and transparency of the cornea. Destruction of these limbal stem cells and the stem cell niche, or both, leads to limbal stem cell dysfunction and deficiency. Limbal stem cell deficiency in itself results in delayed epithelial wound healing, recurrent epithelial erosions, and loss of vision. So these are various clinical pictures of limbal stem cell deficiency, which is characterized by conjunctivalization of the cornea or penis formation, recurrent epithelial breakdown and in turn inflammation of the ocular surface, and loss of transparency of the cornea leading to impaired vision in these cases. There are various causes of uh, limbal stem cell deficiency, but here our uh, IC is related to ocular burns. I would like to share this reference of uh, various causes of limbal stem cell deficiency, especially unilateral cases, wherein one of these studies showed that uh, almost, you know, 84% of the cases were uh, contributed by ocular surface burns, and we are concentrating on that area. While in bilateral injuries, uh, it was almost, you know, uh, one-third kind of, you know, in distribution. Uh, corneal transplantation alone is ineffective in limbal stem cell deficiency as it results in recurrent epithelial breakdowns, surface healing issues, and ultimately graft failure. So fortunately, we are very fortunate that, you know, limbal stem cell transplant can restore the normal epithelial phenotype and can re-establish a stable corneal surface. Here I won't go into the detail of epithelial healing, but we all know that the limbal stem cells reside at the limbus and into the limbal niche and crypt. And from here, there could be asymmetric and symmetric division, and it can take care of the whole epithelial surface. In patients with unilateral limbal stem cell deficiency, the healthy fellow eye can serve as a donor cornea, uh, donor limbal tissue, which makes the procedure autologous and obviates the need for any systemic immunosuppression. These are uh, clinical examples of limbal stem cell deficiency following chemical injuries. You can see that the first picture on your left-hand side shows almost partial limbal stem cell deficiency, almost 180 degree with uh, uh, pseudoterygium or you can say a panis extending onto the cornea. Uh, the second picture shows there is, even ad in addition to panis, there is a lot of corneal scarring into the central area, patchy scarring. And the third shows almost 360 degree limbal stem cell deficiency leading to total conjunctivalization of the cornea. And uh, the cornea is totally obscured with the conjunctiva. So, but this healing is also good. I would say that if you reach to this end result, in an acute burns, it is a good achievement. Once you have reached to this level, you can definitely do a lot of, you know, I mean, reconstruction for these cases. 
uh, here I would like to share an algorithm for management of LSCD, limbal stem cell deficiency. Uh, essentially, before you know you go on to embark on to management of limbal stem cell deficiency, you would like to control the inflammation on the, onto the ocular surface, uh, which could be in the form of medical management and, uh, you know, I mean, later on surgical involvement. Here I have highlighted, you know, I mean, two squares in terms of uh, when we are dealing with unilateral limbal stem cell deficiency, there are various modalities available. One of them is uh, conjunctival limbal autograph, uh, slut and clut. We would go about it in detail. So techniques of limbal transplantation has evolved over the last three decades. And uh, fortunately enough, you know, all of them are still, you know, I mean, currently uh, uh, in practice. Uh, I would talk about conjunctival limbal autologous transplantation, which was popularized by Kenyon and Seng in way back in 1989. Uh, essentially, what they did was the procedure included obtaining two grafts of two clock hours, each from the limbus, and the adjacent rim of conjunctiva was taken from the patient's healthy eye, and especially superior and inferior limbus. And this procedure has the longest track, and it, this is implanted onto the affected eye after removing the panus and all, as you can see here here in the pictures or schematics. This procedure has the longest track record so far and has been shown to successfully restore the corneal epithelium in approximately 75% of the cases. But later on, you know, a lot of other researchers did, you know, research and they realized that, you know, it is not possible to restore a full cornea with 360 degree limbal stem cell deficiency with just one technique. Then, you know, I mean, the concept of, you know, cultivated limbal epithelial stem cell came. Uh, Dr. Pellegrini and group uh, popularized this technique, wherein in 1997 they described cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation, where a two by two millimeter small piece of limbal biopsy was taken from the donor eye, which is expanded ex vivo in the laboratory for 10 to 14 days into a sheet of epithelial cells, and then it is transplanted onto the surface of the affected eye. That means you just call the patient for first, you know, I mean, taking the limbal biopsy, and then after expanding that limbal biopsy into laboratory, you again call the patient for, you know, I mean, transplantation of these cultivated limbal stem cells. So that required two-stage procedure, plus you need uh, culture facilities and lot of regulatory, you know, I mean, uh, things are required. So that is a very expensive thing, and probably it is within the armamentarium of institutional practice. Uh, the third technique, which was, uh, you know, I mean, this was Dr. Uh, Virendra Sangwan and group described in 2011-12, uh, came up with a novel idea of simple limbal epithelial transplantation, uh, wherein they used, you know, in, especially in lim unilateral limbal stem cell deficiency. And they, like, you know, a strip of donor limbal tissue from the superior limbus was taken, similar to CLET. And that, that was, you know, I mean, uh, transplanted onto the healthy eye. But here, instead of uh, XVO expansion, it was divided into small pieces. And these explants were transplanted directly onto the affected cornea uh, for in vivo expansion over human amniotic membrane graft along with fibrin glue. So that works as a scaffold for these, you know, I mean, cells. So this, these are the steps of uh, SLAT in, you know, I mean, uh, uh, the pictures is showing different steps of uh, slat procedure. Later on, certain modifications were described like customized slat where, you know, if there is a more area of involvement, uh, the limbal ex uh, explants were uh, put into the, those areas. Uh, even uh, some researchers described sandwich technique wherein another uh, amniotic membrane was uh, covered on top of the explanted uh, limbal stem cells. and. Uh, it was also combined with conjunctival autograft and combined with mucous membrane graft. Looking at the results, a uh, lot of researchers came up with, you know, I mean, multicell central studies and the results were very encouraging. As you can see here, they compared, you know, autologous limbal stem cell transplantation with CLET and SLET. Uh, especially autologous limbal stem cell transplantation for unilateral limbal stem cell deficiency showed anatomical and functional success rate of almost 69% and 60% respectively without any serious adverse events in the donor eye. While the anatomical and functional success rates of uh, SLED, that is simple limbal epithelial transplantation was 78% and 68.6% and con I mean conjunctival limbal autologous transplant was 81% and 74.4%. They were comparable and significantly better than those of CLET, which was a little lower, as you can see here in this bar diagram as well. 
uh, people also compared, you know, cost of uh, uh, cultivated limbal epithelial transplant and the simple limbal epithelial transplant, and it turned out to be the results of economic analysis suggested that SLET provide an estimated cost savings of almost US dollar 6470.88 for adults and 6673.10 for children. In broad term, if we translate that, the cost of SLETs is approximately 10% of the cost of CLET for adults and 8% for the children. So let's look at the technique. Here is a video of showing how uh, simple limbal epithelial transplantation is done. This patient had a chem I mean, acid injury and had undergone quinone plasty twice. You can see here I'm taking, you know, I mean, two conjunctival grafts from the donor eye. And here I'm dissecting the limbus to uh, uh, obtain, you know, I mean, small one clock hour of limbal tissue, which can be splitted into eight to 12 pieces and transplanted onto the affected eye uh, in, you know, I mean, small pieces. The donor eye is covered, so now we are working on the recipient eye after dissecting the penis. Both the, you know, I mean, conjunctival autographs are applied onto the superior and inferior limbus so that there is no, I mean, it works as a barrier. Uh, it does not allow, you know, simbleferon formation or pseudoterygium formation. Then an amniotic membrane is applied onto the entire corneal surface, which works as a scaffold for these, you know, I mean, transplanted cells. Once that, that is applied, uh, the limbus which was, you know, harvested is cut into small pieces. Approximately eight to 12 pieces are enough to uh, take care of both the surface epithelium as well as the limbal niche in these cases. This is fixed with the help of fibrin glue and a bandage contact lens is applied, and in some cases we also do a tarsography at the conclusion of this surgery. You can see here the same patient preoperatively and postoperatively in these clinical pictures. He was a 28-year-old male who sustained lime paste injury. Uh, he underwent genoneplasty and amniotic membrane transplant twice elsewhere before he was referred to us. And as you can see here in clinical picture on your left-hand side, he had very severe simbleferon, almost involving the lid being attached to the limbus, inferior lid and a lot of panels covering almost the entire, you know, I mean, uh, 360 degree of corneal uh, limbus, except a small patch of, you know, one clock hour of uh, limbus here. So this was the post-op result, post, you know, I mean, trans limbal epithelial transplant. This is another case where, you know, I mean, a 10-year-old male child sustained lime paste injury. Uh, post simbleferon, and these are the clinical pictures, post simbleferon release with panis resection and conjunctival limbal autograph. Here we decided to take a conjunctival limbal autograph because the area involved was much less. So it did not need, you know, I mean, slut procedure. This is another example where 180 degree of, you know, I mean, limbus is covered with panis. So we decided to have, you know, I mean, uh, slut with conjunctival autograph and you can see the results postoperatively. This was a 23-year-old female with unilateral acid injury, underwent autologous let from a fellow eye, and base, best corrected visual acuity improved from, from six uh, uh, CFC of counting finger close to face to six nine. You can see a, a dramatic results of these uh, procedures here. Here is a 45-year-old male uh, who uh, sustained you know, injury with a disinfectant pow powder almost 30 years back. And uh, that eye was not uh, like, you know, I mean, it was partially amblyopic, but he was, you know, I mean, presenting with recurrent surface breakdowns and inflammation, as you can see here into the clinical pictures. He underwent slut and uh, conjunctival autograph, and uh, this is how his surface looks, and the eye has become quiet eventually. This is 32-year-old male who sustained splash of liquid ammonium chloride 18 years prior to presentation. He underwent some pseudoterygium surgery elsewhere, and he had again, you know, penis formation. So we had to take him for slut, and he underwent conjunctival autograph horizontally. You can see two, two graphs on both the sides, and underwent a slut, and you can see that the eye has become quiet, and his vision improved from 624 part to 612. So you can have fantastic results post this procedure. Uh, to summarize, techniques of limbal transplantation have evolved greatly over the past few decades. SLET combines the advantages of both conjunctival limbal autograph and uh, cultivated limbal epithelial transplant. It is a simple, inexpensive, and single-stage procedure. Anatomical and functional success rates are equal or sometimes higher with SLET compared to uh, conjunctival limbal autograft and CLET. The costs are significantly lower with SLET compared to CLET, making it the technique of choice for limbal transplantation almost globally. 
In the setting of bilateral limbal stem cell deficiency, allogenic SLET is a potential option, but that will require long-term systemic immunosuppression, which is not needed in unilateral injuries. Thank you for your kind attention, and thank you for the opportunity. Okay, Dr. Poros, nice, excellent presentation. So now Dr. Sopnil will be talking about this lead visual rehabilitation in bilateral ocular burn cases by different modalities of treatment. Over to you, Dr. Sopnil. Good evening. So let's move on to bilateral ocular surface burn. And this is uh, in the category mentioned by Dr. Aditya. This is in, usually in severe category where you get total limbal stem cell deficiency and followed by panache formation all over the cornea. So this is the usual picture when you uh, see a patient with bilateral uh, limbal, severe total limbal stem cell deficiency. And this is the uh, actual challenge when such patient comes and how to rehabilitate those patients, we'll see. So we have a uh, couple of options uh, in bilateral total LSCD. One is doing a keratoprosthesis. Uh, second is doing allogenic SLET. Uh, we all know about SLET. Dr. Paras presented it extensively now. And uh, second is alloclate. Uh, SLET, uh, she has already uh, described that we just take a simple piece of limbus and then divide it into multiple pieces and then place it uniformly over the amniotic membrane and it epithelizes the surface. Uh, in this particular case, because we don't have the uh, ipsilateral eye, healthy eye, so we have to resort to either uh, the donor or donor limbal cells from the cadaveries or maybe a living related uh, donor limbal cells. So uh, this is uh, one of the case where, you know, uh, we had to uh, this is one bilateral LSCD. Uh, we decided to do a cadaveric slit when I was at LVP. So this patient, uh, we did a cadaveric slit. The difference, uh, we came to know later that we have to place the explants slightly away from the limbus because these are allogenic explants and, uh, you know, they tend to get rejected very early. So what we did here was uh, we placed the explants like we place in usual slit because we had a lot of limbus tissue. This was first case of allogenic slit we tried and we didn't have any idea that, you know, we were very happy that we have so much of a limbus available and we'll place it all over the cornea so that it will get, you know, epitalized nicely. So patient was started on steroids and asked to continue Azuron, but uh, patient came at three months, discontinued Azuron, came with pain and blood vision and this was the picture. So patient had dilated perilimbal vessels as we all can see, epithelial edema and peripheral vascularization. So uh, here, this, uh, at that time, this was first case of allogenic slit. We didn't even know what are the signs of allogenic reje rejection. So that's where we diagnosed it as an ejection because if we look at closely, the vessels were attack literally attacking onto the explant in the periphery. So that was the mistake we made that we placed the uh, explants more in the periphery and the patient also discontinued immunosuppression. And that's how patient landed up with rejection and then we had to treat this patient with uh, methylprednisolone, patient recovered very well. And then from that, patient maintained uh, uh, on, was maintained on immunosuppression and maintained very good vision. So this is first post-operative day, this is one month, and this is two months. But after that, again, patient recovered and patient maintained ambulatory vision for uh, after that. So this is the story about cadaveric slit. So that's why uh, allogenic slit, we can, uh, th this is the case we published in BJO. Uh, we can do allogenic slit only in patients uh, who are a uh, good candidate for immunosuppression. If the patient is not good candidate for immunosuppression, we cannot, cannot think of uh, allogenic slit because it is going to reject. It is, it is an allogenic slit. Coming on to uh, bilateral limbal stem cell deficiency where we do Kepro. So those patients where patients are not fit for immunosuppression or we, for some reason we feel that the allogenic slit is not a good idea, we resort to uh, keratoprosthesis. So essentially type 1 keratoprosthesis is nothing but a back plate which holds the capro in place and if it sandwiches the uh, cornea in between the capro and to the uh, back plate. So this is how there are two designs. One is with the PMMA back plate and one is with the uh, titanium back plate. Uh, this PMMA back plate also has a locking ring which uh, holds the cornea and the uh, capro together. Contraindicated contraindications are most important. Severe dry eyes, you cannot do type 1 Kpro, severe simbiferon because patient is not able to maintain the uh, BCL and BCL is must for these patients. Active infection is again a contraindication. And the most important contraindication is patient who is not able to follow up frequently. Follow up is very important in these patients. How we do it? So this is the assembly of the Kpro. So what we do, we uh, refine the central uh, three millimeter of the cornea. So this, 
we are we are refining this central 3 mm which we are going to uh, use for the kpro to come out of the cornea so this is how this once we refine the central 3 mm then there is one adhesive tape which comes with the kpro so you have to take out the tape and put the something so uh, assemble the kpro like this once we put the cornea then we put the back plate this is a PMMA backplate of type 1 K-Pro. And then we put the locking ring. This step is very important. Locking ring should uh, fit uniformly so that there is no area where there is a gap between the uh, 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 backplate and the locking ring. And then the uh, rest of the procedure is as we do uh, our keratoprosthesis. And it just like a keratoprosthesis, you have to refine around 9 millimeter. Uh, the whole assembly you have to keep like that. Uh, only thing you have to take care is that the whole back plate is inside the anterior chamber rather than you know one is protruding in the junction and all you have to take care of that and then suture carefully so the procedure is pretty simple like keratoprosthesis but the follow up is important and uh, later on we have to uh, follow up patients uh, periodically uh, for the uh, development of any complication so as when it what kind of sound is that um, so uh, basically, uh, the good candidate for type 1 keratoprosthesis is very difficult to find. But yes, following things we have to keep in mind that surgeon should be very committed. Patient follow-up is must. You uh, patient should be able to uh, change the bandage contact lens frequently with any local surgeon. Uh, topical antibiotics patient has to pull all the time. He, patient has to check digital IOP, visual field, and B scan periodically. Also, the surgeon should always be ready to tackle emergencies. You cannot say, no, that I'm outside, I cannot do my work, work time is over. When you do KPRO, you should be committed enough to uh, serve that patient anytime because complication can arise anytime. Also, uh, you should have some friendly retina colleague who is willing and who can see through the KPRO whenever any complication arises because uh, not all the retina surgeons would be you know, familiar with the KPRO and that particular visualization. Uh, sometimes we have to modify the K-Pro. So this gentleman came from Gujarat and he had an accidental fall of molten metal. Uh, so I operated his both eyes in June 2014. When we saw him, uh, he had right eye already ev eviscerated. Left eye was timely rescued by doing MMG by surgeon, oculoplastic surgeon in Gujarat. Lead reconstruction was attempted but was not possible. So what we left, uh, what we left was uh, with was the MMG partially covering the surface. No lids, nothing. The other eye was completely eviscerated and this condition this gentleman came. So we didn't have the option of type 2 Boston K-Pro because there was no uh, lid. Type 1 K-Pro, no, again, uh, no lid protection for the graft. We cannot put BCL, anything. So type 1 K-Pro is again out of question. So here what I decided was to do type 1 K-Pro under that uh, existing MMG. So what we did here was, so we just tried to lift that MMG because I had not done the primary MMG, some oculoplastic surgeon had done, so I decided to go ahead slowly uh, while uh, lifting the... So here I am trying to separate the MMG which is already done and I don't know whether the cornea is thin, it is melted, whether there is any perforation pre-existing which got sealed by MMG, so I am going very slow, uh, trying to visualize every time, not going uh, through the bleeding area and trying to visualize and go slowly. So this is how you have to uh, be very slowly because it's like a Pandora box. So you don't know what you are going to find out beneath the MMG. And uh, this is how I could lift the uh, pre-existing MMG with thin areas in between. And uh, one thing you have to do is you have to uh, keep intact the inferior blood supply. Otherwise the MMG will melt again when we use it again. So this is how uh, once we completely expose the cornea, Sorry, it is not going ahead. I think same thing happening with me. <laughs> it's going back again and again. Can you please help me? You know, I'm again is going. You click on it, it will go back. Here, see. See the count. Okay. 
थैंक यू राइट so uh, here uh, what we did we lifted the flap i'll just skip the initial part and then we did a usual trifination we removed the cataract uh, or maybe a lens because i don't want to have a lens in position when i'm doing a capro so this is our way of doing cataract surgery for cornea surgeons and once we remove the cataract once the cortex is thoroughly clean then the capro is assembled in a usual way type 1 capro and then it was sutured in place and uh, once we suture the capro what we did here differently was just you know place the mmg back we didn't expose it we didn't do anything we just placed it back and i thought let it vascularize and then i'll open the capro later on so what happened next so when i did this on the post operative day 4 when i saw the patient this mmg had already started retracting from the superior area and the capro had already started exposing so on day 7 patient called me that doctor saab mujhe to dikhne laga i am very happy but uh, i was not really happy because i know i knew that the capro is getting exposed and that's why i decided to follow up this patient closely so this was the uh, uh, so where i here what i did is i just made the upper uh, sur uh, surface of the lid under surface raw and then stick it over the uh, scleral surface upper edge of the capro this is how uh, post operative four weeks patient was doing well and he had a 6 12 visual acuity again he developed a melt uh, at this area and uh, i got worried that the because these burn cases are they have lot of areas of ischemia and scleral melt tends to occur so again i did a fresh mmg and covered this area with the fresh mmg again this started melting again uh, again mucosa was undermined again it was pulled toward medial side and toward the capro and then finally it got covered completely with the mucosa so four months after primary surgery patient had visual acuity of 69 this is five months follow up patient was maintaining vision 69 Six months, six nine, and then three years. Patient is still six nine, and this is now recent follow-up, seven years, and patient is still maintaining visual acuity of six nine. So uh, basically, what Capro needs is a very stable ocular surface, and even if you are not, uh, you know, there is nothing uh, fixed protocol what you are supposed to do. You have to do according to the condition. Sometimes you get uh, children like this. This was nine year old male, nine year old woman. Again, one eyed patient. Uh, he lost both eyes in accidental follow-up chuna. and this was his condition so uh, i was not very willing to do capro in this particular patient because capro in pediatric cases is uh, almost equivalent to disaster it's very difficult to maintain so what i did here was so this was a very i i do i didn't know what is there inside i just decided to open it and see so here i gradually tried to undermine the panus and remove everything with difficulty and this is what i landed up with so it was just a piece of some wrinkled cornea with lot of scleral thinning and when i cleaned it up i didn't know where is the limbus where is the cornea how to go ahead with pk so this was the area i left with this was scleral thinning so i decided to go ahead with a pk because that was the only option i had at that point of time so i did uh, i uh, preserved the lens in this particular patient again glaucoma is the issue in children so i decided to preserve the lens and i did pk what i did here was superiorly there was absolutely no conjunctiva so i used an mmg from the extracted from the lower lip and this graft is nicely fashioned thinned out and then placed onto the bulbar surface so this is the area where uh, we put the mmg you can see inferiorly so this mmg was superiorly as well and inferiorly it was attached and you have to put the mmg very firmly and I'll, i also put some cadaveric uh, slit implants i had inferiorly just with the hope that you know with immunosuppression i should be able to get a, get away in this particular case because the reason is simple we cannot do capro in this patients it's going to fail and let's see what happens uh, this was the case so i put a limb a lot of limbus superiorly and inferiorly and this was day 7 patient had a 660 visual acuity this is one month patient was still maintaining 624 and this is almost 2 years now though the mmg is trying to encroach onto the cornea it has stopped there i was hoping that it will not come here i am still hoping and still fortunately there is no rejection i'll think of doing something else once it occurs but presently is maintaining visual acuity of 624 and very happy so uh, this is all about bilateral uh, chemical burns uh, so uh, when it comes to bilateral ocular surface burns the uh, the key is that surgeon need to be an architect like you have to design your own plan there is no fixed plan for particular case and then you have to create your piece of art what you are going to do according to uh, your dedication and wisdom you can do you can use scientific and technological development and you can make that piece of art and then try to give vision to this patients thank you so much
nice talk, Sapnil. <coughs> Wonderful videos. So one thing just I wanted to tell you that in allosylate, in your cases, Sapnil, you put a lot of implants, transplants. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because in allosylate, what you have to do is that even if you get this slate from this limbal tissue from your, that means donor areas like the uh, living related donors, so you put minimal. If you put maximum, then you are putting more load, more antigenic so the, load the over the corner. The case we did was the first case of allosylate. Okay. <laughs> All over the world. Easy. So, so we didn't know what to do, you know, we just, we had a cadaveric limbus, <laughs> lot of limbus, and we were very happy, oh, kitna limbus tissue, we can put lot of limbus tissue and get lot of epithelium. So that was the so first that's case that's uh, okay. when that's we okay. tried allosled. Right. It was the initial okay. days of sled in 2012. Okay. Yeah. So now I am inviting any questions from the audience. If you have any questions or if you have any comments, please let us know. In your last case which you showed, the child with the Lyme injury, is he on immunosuppression? Yes, he is on immunosuppression. I forgot to mention it over there. Uh, yeah, I have to keep, because the, the epithelium which has covered the graft has come from the cadaveric limbal stem cells, which I put uh, superiorly and inferiorly. So this patient has to be on immunosuppression. And let me tell you very frankly, we don't have any other option in this patient. Because we cannot do K-Pro. That is the primary limitation in children. So whatever you can get away other than K-Pro, you just try to do in your best possible way. And this is the best way we can do it. What is the drug you are using? Sorry? What was the drug? That, that drug, in this particular patient, I am using cyclosporine. Okay. Yeah. You can u even use two drugs depending on your rheumatologist and rheumatologic support. Did you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, we can. In fact, I just wanted to make one more comment that these are the cases wherein a tarsorapy would again come in handy. When you are doing these extensive procedures, you would like to add up uh, tarsorapy so that you allow the surface to heal faster. As Dr. Swapnil pointed out that even for acute chemical injuries, you would like to do a tarsorapy to allow the surface to heal faster. Uh, all in all, it was a very nice okay. session. The key point is do tarsorapy when you cannot do anything. Thank you. <laughs> in acute chemical injury. So if there is no question, then we can conclude our session. I thank my all these uh, these co-instructors uh, co and all, also the audience for such a wonderful course. Okay then. Thank you all.